talking about today is um, a think piece, really. Um, we're not saying that we've got all the answers, it's just something that we've been um, working on uh, and it's something that we find interesting. So we definitely welcome any feedback that anybody's got. Um, so I'll start off with a bit of context and some background on what we think the problem is and then we'll present two different <coughs> um, contrasting approaches that we think bound the analysis space and then we'll try and pick out where the themes are between the two of them. Um, Andrew and I are mathematicians at ARC. ARC's a small consultancy company based in Westbury and we specialise in evidence-based decision support, primarily for defence. So whilst this um, has quite a defence uh, focus, uh, we do think it's applicable to other technical um, operational systems as well. So um, what we want to talk about today is capability exploitation and specifically this valley of death, which I think uh, most people are familiar with. So on the left hand side we've got a new technology and on the right hand side is uh, where that technology gets exploited. And for anything that can't be exploited, down in the valley that's where the good ideas have gone to die. So what do we need to do to try and ensure that new technologies can be brought across? So I suppose one thing is to build a bridge of evidence. And this bridge needs to be um, robust enough uh, to withstand scrutiny. And ideally, there needs to be a clear start point. So what exactly is it that the new technology or the new capability delivers? And there also needs to be a clear end point. So how will it be used? But where that's particularly difficult is when it's a disruptive or a revolutionary technology type, because it's not always obvious what the new technology will look like. And it, uh, it's especially not obvious how it could be used. So some uh, defence-specific challenges. Um, first off, the UK uh, Ministry of Defence cannot afford to lose the technical edge over adversaries. So it can never operate in a reactive role when it comes to threats. Uh, second is that whatever uh, the new technology is, it needs to fit in with, as part of a wider system. So for example, if we're talking about a new um, maritime weapon system, it needs to be integrated into a ship and then that will throw up a load of other design issues. So for example, uh, weight, um, stability, uh, command and control software. So it's all, it's a, it always has to be a system of system approach. Um, third, there is very rarely a fixed operational use case. Um, where there is a fixed use case, um, evidence shows us this doesn't always result in a value for money acquisition. So, for example, some of the land platforms that were procured specifically for the deserts in Afghanistan, um, there needs to be um, a structural rethink before they can be re-rolled again in kind of an urban fighting capacity. And the fourth one is that there are some very specific challenges of defence procurement, which I won't go into now because we could talk about it for hours, uh, that means that procurement is often quite long and it can be very complex. So um, it's difficult to bring something new into service. So the easier something is to upgrade, the more flexible it is, and the more that you allow for spiral development, the better. And then the last factor is this Daily Mail test. If something goes wrong, um, the Daily Mail will report it, and it, that kind of generates a fear of being perceived as, as making the wrong decision. And that in itself is kind of a vicious circle, because it almost uh, means that somebody is, is too afraid to do anything rather than do the wrong thing. So this Daily Mail test kind of boils down to having to evidence value for money. So first of all, um, is there an operational requirement for whatever the new technology is? Uh, we need to account for whole life cost. So that's not just the cost of the equipment, but it's the cost of everything that goes into it. So the training, the infrastructure, and also the through life support costs. Um, it needs to be evidence to show how effective something is. So how much bang for the taxpayer book, and then when the MOD come to deliver that bang, what's going to stop them and what are the barriers? So I think it's clear that for novel and disruptive technologies, there's often a lack of exploitation matu um, maturity. And then that, when you compound that with the issues that you would normally affect, um, normally see with low maturity technologies, it's really difficult. And because of that, there's a significant amount of uncertainty surrounding the disruptive technology. And that bridge at the start um, is not robust. So where is all this uncertainty? Um, so this is a picture of a laser weapon system potentially. Um, I got it off the Lockheed Martin website. So you can see there's a, a drone being shot down by some kind of laser system. 
So the first area that the MOD would need to think about is obviously how much does it cost? And that uh, needs to cover everything, not how much just does the equipment cost. Um, how many people will be needed to operate it? And um, what will the backgrounds be of those people? So do we now need them to be potentially degree, um, degree qualified rather than coming straight from school? What's the training that they'll need? How effective is it? And remember at this stage what we're talking about is something that is, is novel and disruptive. And the MOD don't necessarily need know what it will look like or how it will be delivered, but they need some understanding of how effective it's going to be. What's the environmental impact? So uh, how much power does it need? What's the cooling requirement? And when can it be integrated into a wider system? So when will this technology be ready? And what platform will it go on? And then how does that fit in with the capability management plan for that particular platform? So I think what I'm trying to get at is the bridge that um, was on the slide a few um, minutes ago, it's not just um, a single strand bridge, there's multiple individual and interconnected strands and especially for a novel and disruptive technology type there can be massive amounts of uncertainty within each of those strands. Um, so if we take any one particular strand and we look at um, the standard defence acquisition um, cycle that goes from concept through to assessment, demonstration, in service and in the end disposal. At the start of concept, um, there can be massive uncertainty bounds around whatever it is that you're looking at, which means there's a lot of risk in the programme. As that moves on to assessment and demonstration phase, these get narrower. And by the time the capability is in service, in reality there's peaks and troughs of whatever it is that you're trying to measure, but that tends to fall within some kind of vol volatility window. So what that means is that the initial estimates that were based on probably a static metric um, give, give a an envelope, but actually it's, it's something is driving a peak and trough within those. What would be ideal and better for the MOD is if this massive bound at the start could be narrowed, so if people were able to make better decisions from the outset and there was less risk in a programme initially, and also if the MOD could understand what drives some of these peaks and troughs, because then they could mitigate them from the outset. So. We think what's needed is a complex approach to capturing and reducing some uncertainty right from the outset. So what we propose is that there needs to be um, a list of divergence factors or risks and we need to look at them in terms of probability, magnitude and criticality. So far that's all just standard risk um, management. But what we also need to do is look at the relationships between some of these factors. So let's say we've got a number of factors, we can plot out when they occur. So this is in all likelihood probably a gross oversimplification because when we've done this before we actually had about a hundred factors rather than five but um, that's just an example. So uh, we know when they occur and we can start to look at the uh, relationships between them and what we can then do is build up um, a probabilistic network of all the factors that could affect the delivery of this capability. Um, then what the MOD could potentially look to do is try and look at what some of these small perturbations might be that influence some of the bigger ones. So if a tiny change in some of these earlier factors has a massive effect onto factor 4, which occurs later, is that kind of analysis that the MOD could potentially bring out. So the first approach that we present today we call the Divergence Assessment Framework. So uh, we form a network to account for all of these dependencies and we look at uh, the relationships between them. So that will allow MOD to draw out conclusions like what's a safe contracting period for, for example, um, a part of a ship based on the price of steel, which is influenced by a number of factors that feed into that. So that means that the capability can be optimally designed from the outset and some of the big risk can hopefully be mitigated right in concept phase, so that reduces some of the risk from the outset. Okay, uh, so that's the, the sort of first half of the presentation. Um, I'm going to sort of bring that into sort of context of what what we think that is useful for, and sort of um, present the flip side of things in terms of a, a, a sort of an alternative approach. Um, so, does it, the divergence assessment framework um, was a sort of funded piece of work a year or so ago? Um, it was the next stage for that is thinking about it in terms of rolling out into um, enabling policy and, and a new way of thinking in terms of planning for future acquisition and, and de-risking your design and specification phase. So that's um, 
being thought of in terms of how do we embed that within um, policy documentation in terms of log future log log logistic support, but also the way that we um, build our investment appraisal and, and, and sort of build the evidence for um, the uh, approvals phases. Now, the, the main thing about this is that it, it, there's the analytical tool itself, but there's also the behaviours and the process that goes with it. So it's really focused on a new way of thinking. Um, so whilst the divergence assessment, assessment framework can be quite labour intensive in terms of the analytics involved, um, what I'm going to talk about is a, a sort of a similar but um, slightly softer uh, method for thinking about the same factors but without the, 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 the huge requirement on a, a large set of um, um, judgments essentially and lots of different factors. So this all comes down to um, the fact that MOD needs to manage its own affordability, it's got a budget line, um, it's got um, the requirement to demonstrate that it's continuing to demonstrate value for money. Now we wanted to tr try and relate that to a non-defence um, um, context and you know it, it's a, probably a simplification, I don't want to get into the sort of the argument about similarities between public spending and, and the, the, the private sector, but really it's just down to the ability to maximise the profitability and its reputation that goes with a, with a, with a private sector's company's um, order book. So we think it's relevant to the other, to other sectors as well. So the, as I said, the divergence assessment framework, um, as I said, the, the, how can we ensure though that that, that process is, is rigorous? And I use the capital rigor, for those that know, it is a, um, a set of uh, words that describe how you should build up a, a, a robust um, independent and grounded in reality, et cetera, et cetera, analysis process. So do we have a meaningful set of um, historical data points that we can base these future divergence factors on? Do we understand our future operational state enough based on historical set of um, examples that we can analogize? And, and can we rely enough on the, on the judgments of, of experts and, and the engineering um, SMEs that, that understand the system and understand the future scenario? Now that kind of comes down to how disruptive and how novel the technology is, and, and as you can imagine in a laser weapon scenario, it's it's a very difficult, different way of operating. The MOD has to think um, very holistically about the whole of, whole of its organisation and how it delivers that capability. So clearly, there needs to be some pragmatic approach to, to selecting a, the extent to which you use a, a sort of a framework like this. Um, and as I said before, it's mo mostly about the process and the way of thinking than the actual tool itself. So if we come back to our bridge, um, and a nice bridge over that valley of death, uh, and we've got a nice archy bridge to, to sort of continue the metaphor. So we've got a right of arc and a left of arc um, sort of approach to this to this this question. So on the on the right hand side, as I've said, this quite this can be quite intensive in terms of the um, historical data points that you need to base your future predictions on, our divergences and probabilities of, of, of risks occurring. So. Do we have enough information to, to, to do that? And um, but how much? To what extent can we use that to plan for to um, to de-risk our future ex exploitation? And that might depend on what, what stage of, of the acquisition process we're in. Um, but I'll come back to that in a minute. On the left-hand side, we might have a sort of a, a softer a softer approach to this, and um, sort of utilising some of the softer systems methodology in terms of thinking about the system dynamics and some of the the, the models that. The, the underpin the, the, the um, relationships between these factors. So rather than analytically um, profiling and modelling and, and, and stochastically building up a prediction of future um, risk propagation, we could just think of the, the major factors that we can de-risk and how do we de-risk our exploitation. Um, which kind of comes back to the, the mystic Meg and the Dumbledore, but uh, you, know, you, can, you can hopefully see the, the, the relevance of those two characters. So we're in, in this, the sort of softer systems methodology, we're really focusing on what those critical factors are. Um, and focusing on the actual core objective of you inserting this new technology. Why is it that you think this technology can benefit your capability objectives? Um, relating your um, system components to how those co interact and, and contribute to your ability to deliver a capability is the, the main objective of this um, softer systems methodology. But again, you can see there's, there's some similarities in the way that we're thinking about this in terms of uh, risk drivers and factors and, and, and trying to research, trying to prioritise our research so that we can ena best enable that um, innovation. So what does this look like in the context of software systems? Of course it looks like a nice management -y style diagram. Um, whilst I don't typically like pie charts, it's not technically a pie chart, it's just a representation of the interdependencies with lots of, lots of factors. So here we're representing um, 
things that you want to deliver, so aspects of your cap future capability and how, and how related they are with each other. So when you're thinking of your exploitation plan over the next 10, 20 years to make this operational, how do you de-risk those elements? So when we think about integrating a system within a platform or building a safety case, what other factors do we need to think of? And this just sort of demonstrates how risky or how interrelated all your factors might be. So it can it can sort of it can sort of build up your understanding of how complex the system is, but does it enable you to um, mature your exploitation route in any way? I mean, there's an argument to say that it might it might initially identify the problem space, but how do you how do you stay, take that one step further? Another way to think about it is in terms of you know a, a relative heat map type style of, of risks and opportunities for your future capability. So can we say that there's aspects of our system that we need to deliver, how do we de-risk the, um, the, the components of our system like the personnel, the training and the, the infrastructure that we need to put in place? Are there relative benefits and, and costs and, and, and risks associated with different potential implementation, implementation strategies and therefore can we trade possible futures of our exploitation? So we can use this sort of, this sort of tool to, to build up that trade space in the very early stages of research. So if we go back to that comparison of you know two broadly generic um, assessment um, uh, analytical concepts, we've got the divergence assessment framework and we've got the SOS systems methodology. But really, really, we wanted to represent it in terms of a, a, a range of different approaches that we could do. One, on one side of things, we've got a very complex um, set, of, set of analysis and, and lots of analytics. In one sense, we've got a, a sort of a, a higher order level systems systems thinking approach and they are kind of um, you know there's pros and cons and there's different levels of maturity that you might need in terms of your source data to implement that. So I overlaid that in terms of where it might be useful along the acquisition life cycle as Charlotte was mentioning with the inverse of the CADMID, um, con you know early phases um, research and development through to various approvals phases of the MOD. How best, how do we select the most applicable tool depending on what stage of analysis, what stage of the project we're in, how mature our design and specification requirement is, um, and can we tailor our in thinking and, and sort of drive those, um, drive the right processes and thinking uh, throughout that acquisition life cycle. So we would argue that actually it's a similar sort of approach that you're taking. One is a much more higher level, but with, there's core themes associated with it in that we're just um, becoming more risk aware and trying to avoid the situation where we're where, um, where we're just dropping things off that value of death so that we're not risk of averse, but we're at least identifying our appetite for that risk. Um, so that we can de-risk future exploitation, we're focusing on the whole system. Uh, we know that there's, there's lots of systems demand dynamics and we need to make sure that we understand the, the, all the uncertainty in terms of how that uh, relates to the future exploitation opportunity. So that's... Our content, just to summarise and go back to the sort of the question that, you know, the slightly arbitrary question we put up front, whilst it may seem a bit odd to sort of relate these two characters, on the one side you've got somebody that's naturally quite insightful and, and has got perfect recall of memory and his, you know, his pensive dream box thing, and, and the other person's got a lot of guts, he's just got lots of, you know, she's, she's certain that the future is, is thus. So there's, on the one side there's, there's can we have perfect recall? Do we have the perfect set of data that we can draw on in terms of historical um, analogies? Or do we just go with it and say, well, let's, you know, let's just say it's innovative. Let's try, you know, let's, let's try and um, insert that technology best, best we can. So obviously we don't, we're not either and we're somewhere in the middle. So just to, just to summarize, um, as I said before, this is, this is about understanding our future uncertainty in the system, um, how do we operate with this new capability, how do we insert this, this innovative and disruptive um, technology as best we can. Um, the whole point of that is, depending on where you are in the stages of, of acquisition, you, your ability to um, innovate as a, as, a, as, a, as a business enables you to say, okay, here's how we, how, here's how we provide focus into that research, how, how do we de-risk the future exploitation of those of those technologies. There's a variety of different ways that you can do it. Um, clearly you have to make a judgment on on, and, uh, on how 
um, restrictive you are in terms of the data available to you and, and, how, and how you think around those problems. But fundamentally, you still have to bring it back to, right, why is it that we want this, this technology? What is, it, what is it achieving in terms of our um, capability objective in the defense terms and, and what the objectives, the strategic objectives of any business might be? Um, that has to that has to underpin your <coughs> your reasoning for um, delivering your technology. So that's it. Any questions?